Hey guys, it's me, Reese Furrow, back again with yet another OVO book reading. And now, we're starting on with book two. The Nameless City. Now, I put time and effort into making the thumbnail for this next book. Instead of using the regular thumbnail, from the last book. I thought I would use like the book cover to do the thumbnail and all with GIMP and all that. I had thought that I was going to be quiet during this week because my cousin was going to be off from holidays, but that is until next week, and I thought uh, she's going to be off from holidays, but she only spent the night, so, also my aunt is, like, currently at a, some sports game in Bozeman, so, time for me to get underway with the new book. Nameless City. Now, I've looked at the. Now, I've looked at the cover. Now, I've looked at the listing here. It'll have prologue, 16 chapters, and epilogue. And that kind of cool. So firstly, we have to get through the introduction as well. So let's get right into it. And let's enjoy. Tonight it will be 10 years since I first met her, and I've decided the time has come to tell our story. To reveal the incredible facts that we witnessed together, Yumi Ishiyama, Bulric Stern, Adela Rabia, and myself, Jeremy Belpois. And Elida, naturally. Not one day has passed when I've not thought of you Elida. This history is for all of my friends, but it is above all else for you, Elida. Goodness knows if you're still listening. Jeremy. Introduction 1985. France. A brilliant professor named Waldo Schaffer and his wife Anthea are working together on an international project of absolute secrecy named Carthage. When Waldo discovers that the true intent of Carthage is not to protect the nations of the world, but instead to develop a lethal new weapon, he decides to leave the project. This choice will lead to irreversible consequences. Anthea Schaffer is kidnapped by mysterious individuals. Waldo however manages to save himself and their three-year-old daughter, Elida. After a lengthy escape, he finds employment as a science teacher at Caddick Academy, in France, and under the name Fermans Hopper secretly continues his experiments. There, in the basements of a disused factory close to the school, he builds a supercomputer and develops a virtual reality named Lyoko, intended to serve as an antidote to sea heritage. However after several years the organization for which the professor worked succeed in tracing him. In 1994, when Elida is 12 years old, Waldo Schaefer takes refuge in the virtual world of Lyoko with his severely injured daughter and extinguishes the supercomputer that powers it. Many years later, Jeremy Belpois, a student at Caddick Academy, is 13 years old, has few friends, and posses SES an innate talent for information technology. Having uncovered the existence of the old factory, through underground tunnels connecting it to Caddick, Jeremy finds the now abandoned supercomputer and he succeeds in reactivating it. In turn he discovers Elida, who through the intervening years has remained imprisoned within Lyoko and has not aged. Together ER with his friends Ulrich, Ad and Yumi, Jaime manages to materialize Elida in the real world. From that moment on the five friends devote themselves to an embittered fight against XANA, a pitiless artificial intelligence that has taken possession of Lyoko. With great effort and after incredible virtual adventures, 
XANA is at LAST defeated thanks to the sacrifice of Furman's Hopper, who survived the many years in Lyoko in the form of a sphere of energy. They are no longer in danger, not anymore. Or so it seems. On December 21st, some months after the defeat of XANA and Hopper's death, Elita suddenly loses her memory. Therefore, on the final day of the Christmas holidays, the friends decide to gather in the Hermitage, the villa where she lived for a period of time, to help her recover her lost memories. The five children begin to investigate the secrets of the Hermit Age and discover a hidden room. Within, they find a video message recorded by the professor which tells part of his history, but any vert he list leaves unsolved at many inextricable mysteries. In his message Hopper entrusts to Elida the task of finding her mother again and asks her to keep for him a golden pendant, a present that he and Anthea exchanged as a pledge of their love. In the Emmy and Time XANA, which the children believe to be defeated forever, progressively regains life and possesses an American girl named Eva Skinner. Some time later, Eva makes her appearance at Caddick. Jeremy, Ulrich, Odd and Yumi choose to help reunite Elida with her mother. They make this choice in good faith, trusting and confident that they are now the only ones aware of the story of Hopper and Lyoko. They are convinced that there is nothing left to threaten them. And that XANA no longer exists. They are very mistaken. Prologue The mysterious city The spires of the city open out before him like the shells of blue ladybugs, punctured by the dark holes of the spaceport. The roads are open, colorful ribbons that interweave between the towers. It is a tranquil moment with only a few ships flying from one place to another, and almost nobody about. In fact there are never many people in the city. The boy appears from nowhere. The air becomes dense, gathers together at one point, and there he is. He flexes his fingers and begins to fly, gathering speed, and then falls as he transforms his flight into a dive. He lands on one of the expressways that lead to the wall and the road surface withdraws docilely to mitigate the impact. He begins to run. He cannot wait to meet up with his friend and show her the new places he has discovered. He adores flying with her along the secluded roads, venturing through the parks and into the empty little shops where they can take what they want and devise an infinite number of games. His friend says the city of pincer-like towers is incredible, but that it is deserted. The boy does not understand what she means, there's himself, the artificial intelligences, and then the professor. Who else could be needed? At the thought of the professor the boy feels a slight twinge of guilt, the professor does not wish for him to assume human form, he says that it is a waste of energy. But his friend has done so, and he wants to at least look a little like her. Perhaps he'll transform himself for her, maybe into those small creatures that she calls ladybugs and which make her laugh. The road ripples in a curtsy before him, the rough surface becoming smooth and translucent like glass. He starts skating, drops to the ground level with a bound, and starts running again. The artificial intelligence responsible for pedestrian traffic appears suddenly before him. It is a metal beanstalk with three bright and vertically arranged eyes. One red, one yellow, and one green. It blocks the road ahead with a bony hand and illuminates its topmost eye, which glows deeply red. As soon as it recognizes him, its yellow eye comes alight. Sir, you were exceeding the speed limit, the AI reminds him. May I ask you to slow down? The boy waves a hand in front of it, authorization denied. The eye of the traffic controller suddenly becomes green, and the creature moves to let him pass. Of course sir, please proceed. The boy runs until the palatial buildings around him start merging into a single colorful blur. With a leap and a bound, he vaults a great bridge of entwined cables, and touches down onto the road on the other side. He spots an information transport AI, it looks like a large squashed egg and is slipping speedily along the street. It must be an important AI, probably working for the professor. It can give him passage. The boy jumps onto it from above, his fingers covered in a thin electrical discharge. He lays his hands on the surface and holds on so as not to fall. They pass the first junction. The second junction. Then the boy jumps off and transfers onto the enamel chin of a waste disposal AI. It is a little slower, but it takes him in the right direction. The wall reaches high into the sky and is made from black bricks. Every time the boy schemes its surface, clear blue lightning arcs between the wall and his fingertips. The wall repels him, it encircles the city and the boy cannot fly over or through it, he cannot pass it. Set in the wall is a single portal, but right now the great doors are closed. The boy presses the palm of his hand to it. 
and on a floating screen that appears from nowhere four shining letters appear. It is the name of the boy, even if he is not aware of it. The door crumbles in a rain of dust, one moment it is there, the next it is not. Beyond the threshold, the boy can see the long drawbridge that disappears on the horizon. It floats in a void, as there is nothing beyond the city, not a moat, or a valley, or a road. Only the bridge, hanging over the dark. Every so often the boy has imagined what it would be like to cross that bridge, but he has never given it serious consideration. It is not encoded in his directives. He looks at the bridge and knows that his friend will soon come across it. Sometime soon he will see her thin figure walking with long strides across the floating arches and take flight. Then he will see that little cloud of pink hairs, and that smile. His friend is a little late, but that does not matter, he can wait, and the city will survive a little longer without him. In any case, other parts of the boy are right now flying over the pagodas, penetrating into the sewers, checking that everything is well. It takes so little effort, that he barely recalls that he is doing it. Now his friend is very late and the boy begins to worry. What has happened? She has always been punctual when she comes to meet him. So he waits, waits motionless before that infinite bridge. Every so often he believes he can see her, see her neat pink hair, little more than a dot, out there in the depths. His friend will not visit anymore. But he does not know that yet. One the man with two dogs he hated being here. He hated the constant relocating. The fact that his work obliged him to move roughly once a week did not change the issue one iota. Grigory Nectapolis let his foot sink onto the accelerator and the pickup truck accelerated from 160 to 180 km per hour. The motor screamed, but he was confident that he could squeeze it up to 220. He had tuned it personally. Not long now, my beauties, he whistled quietly, hearing a subdued growling coming from behind. He turned off the auto route at the first exit without slowing down. It was 3 o'clock at night and there was no one else around. He chose an automated toll booth and paid in cash, pouring a handful of euros into the small basin. The city welcomed him gradually, first some houses and a small group of industrial sheds, then little by little other houses, buildings, apartment blocks. The aeroplane that Grigory had flown in on landed that afternoon after an 11-hour flight. His contact was waiting for him at the airport, an insignificant type that had been holding the leash to his two dogs. He had delivered a bunch of keys to him. For her the man had said. Grigory had not responded and limited himself to reclaiming the keys and the dogs. He had driven without brakes, stopping only to allow the animals to stretch their legs, and now he was hungry and thirsty. And so very sleepy. Later, he said to himself. First thing s first, we finish the job. He reached a tall and narrow turn of the century villa, surrounded by a wooden fence. The garden was covered with snow and it had an almost savage aspect. On the gate a plaque confirmed that this was the hermitage. Grigory smacked his lips but kept on driving, he would have to return here later. He coasted along the street and then crossed the river. On the bridge he turned his head and curiously regarded a little islet that seemed on the verge of sinking under the weight of a deserted factory. Then he turned back, heading towards a great park. He circled the walled enclosure and the pickup mounted the sidewalk, advancing through the shadows of the night like a jaguar on the hunt. Between the trees he could see the black roofs of the buildings, buttressed against each other to form an L-shape, the classrooms, the offices, the student dormitories. So that was Kadok Academy. It looked well connected, a school for privileged children, spoiled any ER do wells. The wall ended in a great wrought iron gate, currently closed, supported by ornate columns on which the school's coat of arms was emblazoned. Grigory Nectapolis smiled and got out of the vehicle together with the two dogs. They walked away for several minutes. Then they came back. Upon their return, one of the dogs became so excited that its teeth latched onto the passenger seat and ripped away a sizable piece of the upholstery. The man caressed the animal's snout. I agree, we've done enough investigating for now. The pickup drove out of the center of the city and eventually pulled up in front of a large, isolated house in the suburbs, the grounds protected by a rusting fence topped with barbed wire. It was one of those properties that adults seem to not notice, and which children avoid because they fear it. Hardly luxurious, Grigory commented to himself. The magician could have found me more comfortable accommodations. He opened the gate with the keys that the contact had passed to him at the airport parked in the tall grass and got down to let the two dogs out. They were both huge rottweilers, 
strong and aggressive, trained to attack. Their names were Hannibal and Scipio. Grigory Nectapolis rubbed his sharp face to expel the creeping fatigue, grabbed his bags and suitcases from the pickup and started unloading the equipment. Her room in the dormitory was icy cold, but her bed sheets were soaked with sweat. She had woken up hearing the barking of dogs, just like in her dream. Maybe she was going mad. Elit arose, shuddering as her bare feet made contact with the cold floor beneath them. She pulled on a sweater. Her bedroom window faced out over the park, and in the dim light of the darkened, pre-dawn sky she could with a little imagination glimpse the shape of the hermitage. The house that had belonged to her father, when he was still alive. She combed her light red hair in front of the mirror. Reflected in its surface she saw herself, a young girl of some 13 years age, but who seemed younger, the eyes ringed with sleep lines, the face thin and tired. For a moment she saw her face as it appeared in her dreams, with pink hair and the pointed ears of an elf, two vertical bands of makeup painted on her cheeks. Which was her true identity. Elida Schaffer, daughter of Waldo and Anthea, Elida Stones, odds fake cousin and female student of Kadok, or Elida the elf girl, inhabitant of the virtual world of Lyoko. Stop thinking like that. Lyoko no longer exists, not anymore. The girl seized her phone from the bedside table and turned it on. On the seventh ring a groggy voice answered her, MMM, hello. It's me. Elida, what's the matter, she got the impression that Jeremy was gropingly searching for his glasses on his own beside cabinet, then she heard him shift and push back the duvet, something falling on the floor. What time is it? Can you come see me? Please. Jeremy did not answer her. But five minutes later, he was knocking on his friend's door. Hot chocolate, with a lot of sweetener. Before arriving the boy had passed the vending machine on the ground floor of the dormitories and collected two drinks. Kind and thoughtful as always. Jeremy absent-mindedly sipped his drink. He was fair-haired and wore a pair of round-lensed glasses set in black frames, along with a woolen sweater hastily pulled on over his flannel pajamas, he looked like he had stolen it from an older sibling. And his expression. Why are you laughing? He asked her. Elida's gaze softened. It's your face. You always look so serious. That's not true, he protested. It's just that there's not enough sugar in this chocolate. You know Jeremy went on after several seconds of silence. I've thought about it and I believe you should transfer into a double room. That way you'd have a companion, and at night you'd feel less alone. Elida impulsively seized his hands and shook her head. No why not? You've not slept properly since we returned to Kadok, and when you do sleep you wake up in the middle of the night, terrified. It'll pass. And what about the nightmares? Always the same dream. Elida managed to swallow half of her chocolate in a single go. More or less she murmured. Do you remember my father's video? And the photo of that house with the mountains reflected in the windows. Jeremy nodded. At the end of the Christmas holidays he, Elida and their friends had taken refuge at the hermitage to share one day together and to help her recover her memories of past events. In the villa's basement they had discovered a secret room and a mysterious video left by Professor Hopper. Elida's father. The boy had watched it almost a hundred times. Elida continued, that house is always in the dream. My father is working outside and mummy is in their room. Except then, except then your mother disappears Jeremy concluded for her. Yes. I run to her and find the wardrobe wide open, the glass smashed in the window frames, her dresses scattered and trampled on the floor. And then I feel that someone is there with me. In the house. He's nearby, and he's breathing heavily. I'm afraid that he'll catch me and then, Elida, calm down. That video of your father must have upset you. This is just your imagination. I'm not mistaken, she replied, looking her friend straight in the face. It's not like that. These are my memories Jeremy, memories that I had forgotten. And then in the dream a huge, black dog has suddenly appeared, and its muzzle is soiled with blood. And then it starts chasing me. I woke up just before it bit me and it seemed to me that I actually could hear dogs barking in the grounds, right under my bedroom window. Jeremy caught her hand. It was so cold, compared to his. Elida blushed. So what do we do now, she asked. We go to breakfast, he answered with a laugh. But first I have to go back to my room briefly. Why? To get dressed. We can't meet with the others in our pajamas. Jeremy and Elida got ready ate breakfast together and then headed out into the school courtyard. 
Waiting for them were their closest friends, those with whom they had shared the extraordinary secret of Lyoko, those who they had been speaking of during the sleepless night. The friends who made growing up seem less arduous. Adela Rabia, wearing a gymnastics tracksuit, his absurdly styled hair defying the breeze. Ulrich's turn, thin and muscular, leaning against a column. And Yumi Ishiyama, her straight corvine hair gleaming against her pale face, almond-eyed, and as usual completely dressed in black. Yumi, the only one of the group who did not live on the campus, but in a house a short distance away with her parents and little brother, was inserting some coins into the coffee machine, while behind her Odd and Ulrich were sniggering together in amusement. Well, what's so funny? Jeremy asked as he and Elida approached them. Odd answered, breathless with laughter, MPF. Nothing at all, except that sissy, Bullrick, hey, what's with the tired faces? Were you guys up late again? I had the nightmare again last night, Elida hurriedly explained. It's that secret room in the hermitage that's to blame, Yumi tried to reassure her. That video of your father has upset you. The girl took her cappuccino from the machine and stirred in the sugar with a plastic teaspoon. She was the tallest of the group, dominating Ulrich in height by the full span of a hand, but she looked so frail and slender that a stranger would find it hard to imagine her dressed in the garb of a warrior. And that's what she was, a warrior. Strong and combative. Unable to resist, Ulrich looked furtively towards her. Just like him, Yumi was reserved, never letting her emotions shine through. That was why they made good teammates. And maybe something more. Ulrich looked away. It was a good thing that we found that video. Now we've got clues, a new trail to follow he commented. Everyone gets bad dreams once in a while Elida, Odd confirmed. You shouldn't read too deeply into them. And now we have history class, the ideal means to fall blissfully asleep. Don't be stupid Odd, Bulric hissed. And we'd better get moving, unless we want to be late. I've got to get away as well, Professor Meyer is setting us a mathematics test, echoed Yumi who was an academic year ahead of them and so attending different classes. See ya later then, Bulric said with a smile. Bulric, Odd, Jeremy and Elida arrived in their classroom five minutes late and rushed inside as the teacher closed the door. Despite their speed they froze up, petrified by the unexpected and corpulent figure of Principal Delmas, who regarded them fiercely from behind the lenses of his glasses. So you've finally chosen to grace us with your presence, have you? Jeremy tried to explain, and then he turned towards Odd and noticed that his friend seemed paralyzed. But not by Delmas. Instead he was transfixed by the person standing next to the principal. A girl. She was not very tall, wore her fair hair cut short, had a golden complexion and large, celestial eyes. She was not part of the student body, Jeremy would certainly have remembered her. And from the look of things it seemed she had torpedoed Odd at first sight. Della Rabia, are you waiting to take your seat? The authoritative tone in the principal's voice brought Odd to his sense. All of you to your places, quickly. The children were quickly seated and the history teacher took her place behind the desk. Delmas cleared his throat, as if to make an official announcement. Very well he began. I am sorry that this announcement could not have been made a week ago at the beginning of term, but better late than never, yes? In any case, students, I am happy to present to you a new classmate who as of today will be attending our school, Eva Skinner. Pleased to meet you, the girl murmured, staring fixedly at a point in front of her. My pleasure. Odd yelled suddenly, all too loudly in the silence of the classroom. Everyone burst into laughter and he turned red up to the tips of his hair, until finally the principal restored silence. Yes, we're sure it's a pleasure for you Odd, thank you for that contribution. So, Eva has just arrived with her parents from the United States of America. Which city may I ask? The girl stared at him without answering. Delmas smiled indulgently. Perhaps you still haven't mastered our language. Where do you come from, Eva? He asked, slowly enunciating the words. Eva answered without looking at him, Etats Unis d'Amerik. Her French was spoken with a very strange accent. Jeremy glanced at Odd who was staring at Eva with an expression like a blanched fish, his eyes glazed and his mouth hanging half open. Bullrick, who was seated beside him, jabbed him in the ribs with an elbow to bring him back to reality. Well the principal continued. I suppose that you will tell us all about your home city in due course. Then he again addressed the class, meanwhile I wish for you all to receive Eva enthusiastically. 
she will not be living on campus, as her parents live not too far away, but remember that today our newly arrived friend is taking her first steps on a long journey, Odd saw that Jeremy was looking towards him, and mouthed the words, she's so hot. In short, please help her to integrate into our school community and make her feel welcome, not too welcome Mr. Della Rabia, I beg of you. More laughter ensued. Gregory Nectapolis had not washed or changed his clothes, he had not had the time to. But the living room had changed, in appearance at least. On the floor, a bare layer of rough cement laid by the builders many years ago, the two dogs were rolled out. Hannibal and Scipio were contentedly dining on a quarter portion of raw ox, tearing at the meat with their teeth. Gregory had prepped the equipment and had even managed to grab a few hours sleep. Now bundles of electrical cabling hung on the walls, fixed in place with black adhesive tape. Two great monitors were set up on the floor, 42-inch models of Chinese manufacture, along with about 10 or 12 smaller units. Besides them he had installed two parabolic antennas on the roof, positioned so that they were not visible from the road, along with two secondary aerials in the house itself. And then there was the CB, a low-frequency amateur radio receiver, a police scanner to intercept transmissions to and from patrol cars in the area, a computer connected to the monitors, along with two separate computers, and the internet connection, naturally. Of everything that he had offloaded from the pickup only three cases remained sealed. Two were full of video cameras and bugs, surveillance devices. The third was stamped with the emblem of a green phoenix and contained the machine, his precious archive of memory cards. Gregory caressed the lock of the big box and poured himself a cup of tea. He would only use the machine in due course, when the time was right. An automatic rifle was lying on the carpet, next to the principal computer's keyboard. It was an XM-8 assault rifle, a prototype developed for the US Army which had never entered into production. A big boy's toy. Gregory did not think he would actually need the use of weapons to bring this operation to a close, but their presence helped him to concentrate. He sat on the carpet and woke the computer up from standby mode. From the unit's speakers there rumbled the voice of a girl, memories that I had forgotten. And then in the dream a huge, black dog has suddenly appeared, and its muzzle is soiled with blood. And then it starts chasing me. Gregory did not need to consult the dossier to identify the speaker, Elita Stones, alias Elita Hopper, alias Elita Schaffer. A dog. So, the girl had heard his puppies in her sleep. He had to remember to be more cautious. The playback cut out by itself. Two, three seconds. We go to breakfast. This was a different voice. The voice recognition software matched it and pulled up an image on the screen, Jeremy Bell Poise. The directional microphone Grigory had installed was working well, but the acquisition radius was too narrow. Within 24 hours 100% of the girl's bedroom would be covered. He stopped drinking his tea when a black window suddenly appeared on his display, classified call with active encryption. Security level 1. Accept. Grigory accepted the call and on two twin monitors the head and shoulders of a man appeared. He was about 70 years old and wore a grey jacket and a white dress shirt with a deep collar and a blue necktie. The two ends of the collar were held together with a pin fashioned in the likeness of a bird, the emblem of the green phoenix. This was his chief, Hannibal Mago. The magician was playing with the mouse of his computer, the rings that covered his fingers tinkling. His head was shrouded in gloom and a large hat with a wide brim hit his eyes and half of his face, all that could be glimpsed was a square set jaw and a wide mouth that was opened in a sneering grin, putting on two gold teeth on display that were set in place of the canines. Grigory, good day. And to you, sir. The voice of the magician was profound, masked and distorted by electronic instrumentation. Grigory knew that however much work he put in, he would not be able to extract a recognizable audio print from it. Have you had a good journey? The base is operational, sir, Grigory answered. I estimate that I will have placed all the surveillance devices by tomorrow, including in the villa. The magician smacked his lips. Excellent. But remember that surveillance is only one of your objectives. Now that our mark has proved to be active in Kadok Academy, it is an absolute priority to acquire fresh information. Yes sir. Grigory shrank the image of his superior to free up space on the monitor and began to search through the digital dossier, do you have any preferences, sir? Who do you want me to start with? Such matters do not concern me, Grigory, in spite of the electronic distortion, the magician's voice seemed to turn colder. 
It interests me only that our project moves ahead. I want documents signed by the professor. I want the codes. Yes sir. But, above all else, I want confirmation that this famous supercomputer actually exists. The treasonous actions of our most trusted agent 10 years ago were a hard blow. And I have every intention of taking my revenge. Do I make myself clear? Perfectly, sir. In a window on the screen an image had appeared of a little boy, his blonde hair firing up from his head and a comical dog in his lap, behind him were two grown UPS with a disgustingly happy and cheerful air about them. A name flashed up under the photo. Odd. Della Rabia. I'll start with them, sir. The magician's only answer was croaking laughter. Two. From complete boring from zero to alarming in the instant. <laughs> wow. I didn't think that it was going to turn to this kind of thing. But, wow. But to really turn out strong. A nice cool introduction there to see how the last book went. Anyway. I'll be getting this video edited and see how I can get this by Sunday. We'll see. But this is the prologue in chapter one of book two of the Ovio Chronicles. And I am really looking forward to getting this book underway and seeing what surprises await our heroes. Until then. See you all later. Mm.